I'm going to show you how I make sauerkraut. A lot of people have asked me and it's the easiest way to introduce fermented foods into your diet. To make sauerkraut you need green cabbage. I'm using two heads. You need kosher salt and you need a vessel. I'll tell you more later about why I'm choosing this vessel. Uh, you also need a way to cut up the cabbage. You could just use a knife and a cutting board. I'm going to use my food processor with this grating attachment. You also need a bowl, a nice large bowl to put the cabbage into. And then this is not necessary, but I like to use a digital scale for adding the salt. I'm gonna do the whole thing on a time lapse so it's nice and fast and you don't have to sit through watching it. But then at the very end of the video, I'm gonna tell you why I did everything that I did because less people care about that, okay? So now I'm gonna show you how much salt you need to add to your cabbage. I already weighed my bowl and I know that it is 600 grams. So now I'm gonna put the bowl with the cabbage in it on top of my digital scale. And it's 2,560 grams. Hey Google, what's 2,560 minus 600? The answer is 1,960. Yeah. 1,960. Hey Google, what's 2% of 1,960? The answer is 39.2. 39.2. So that's how many grams I want of salt. So 39.2, right? So that, yeah. I'm going to zero my scale, take my kosher salt, and put... <laughs> A little over 39 grams. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just turn 39. A little bit more is a little better than a little bit less. Okay, great. Um, and that is exactly how much salt you need and now I'm done with my ingredients. The next thing I'm going to do is massage and pound the crap out of this cabbage to really break down the cellular wall and get that salt really mixed in there. It's going to start to wilt and that is going to be the brine and that is the liquid that the sauerkraut is in. You want to get as much brine as you can because uh, you want your cabbage to live in that brine. That brine is the preserving fluid, the anti-mold, anti-yeast type of fluid um, that keeps your ferment safe, among other things. So you really want a lot of brine. And so a lot of sitting, a lot of pounding it um, is going to give you what you're looking for. So I'm going to do that next. So this is what it will look like once it's been packed. You'll notice that there's cabbage and brine and some headspace. You might have even noticed in the time lapse that I put what they call a cabbage leaf hat on top of the cabbage and then a fermentation weight on top of that. If you don't own fermentation weights, then you can use a baby food jar or a shot glass or any other type of small glass that you have. Um, inside your jar. I would not use something metal and I stay away from plastic although some people do weigh their kraut down with plastic. Um, 
And then once you have it packed, you uh, sit it on the counter to ferment. It takes about seven to 10 days for your sauerkraut to ferment. And then most people consume it at the end of seven to 10 days. But I like to wait an additional 10 to 12 weeks in the refrigerator before I eat my sauerkraut. And I will talk about that more later in this video. Um, if you do not use a jar like what I'm using, which I'll talk about later, um, you'll likely be using a mason jar with a tight fitting lid or a spaghetti jar with a lid. And in that case, you will need to burp your jar every single day to avoid any kind of sauerkraut explosion. Um, make sure you burp your jar. These are self burping. I'll talk about these later. Um, what else did I want to talk to you about? Um, you're going to notice that the bubbles will start forming after about a day, maybe even sooner, depending on how warm it is in your kitchen. And as those bubbles uh, rise, you'll notice that the um, cabbage level rises and the brine level rises, um, and that's perfectly normal. So when you start to eat your sauerkraut, when you're ready to eat it, um, I recommend that you do not eat more than one teaspoon per day to start with. Um, because one thing that uh, many people don't realize is when you start a brand new probiotic regimen, um, it can give you symptoms of what they call die off. And what that refers to is that in your gut, you have living both good bacteria and bad bacteria. And when you introduce a whole bunch of new good bacteria, it's going to cause competition for the food and the sugars that are in your belly. Um, and so you're gonna end up starving some of the bad bacteria in your belly and those bacteria will die. And when they die, they just go kicking and screaming. They don't like it and your body responds to their death by giving you um, what some people would call like, um, like a cold is coming on. Um, for me, what it felt like was a little bit of sore glands, a little bit of a, a sniffle and um, just a general kind of feeling of achiness, not fe feeling like a cold was coming on. Now, you might be able to avoid that altogether, especially if you start slow or it might be really mild, um, but that's why you wanna start with no more than one teaspoon a day. The good news is that if you keep going, um, those symptoms will go away really quickly and your body will be all the better for it. Um, you're gonna think, oh, I, maybe I'm coming down with a cold. Well, all the more reason to keep taking your sauerkraut every day anyway, and before you know it, it'll be gone. Um, so just a warning about die off. So most of you can stop the video right here. I hope that you enjoy your sauerkraut and please let me know if you have any questions, you can send me a message. You know how to get a hold of me since this video is mostly just for my friends who've asked me to show you how, to, how I make sauerkraut. But if you wanna know a little bit more information, for example, why I've chosen these jars or why I ferment in the refrigerator for 10 to 12 weeks longer um, without opening my jars, then just keep watching. So the first thing that I'll tell you about is these vessels. So, and the second thing I'll talk about is my fermentation period. So these are two different vessels I wanted to show you on purpose. These are the two brands of uh, jar, bale, bale wire jars that I recommend. Um, this one is called Fido, F-I-D-O, and you can find it at any Target and a lot of home goods. It's a really popular one. It's made in Italy. This one is called Le Parfait. It's made in France, and you can find this at the container store or their website. Um, I think this one's cute. I started with that one because I like the way it looked, and I didn't know if I was gonna stick with fermentation, but now I've moved on to the Fido because I wanna buy more of them, and they're cheaper. Um, so the reason why I've chosen these jars over just using a mason jar or a spaghetti jar like a lot of hobby fermenters use is because I learned how to ferment um, by being a part of this Facebook group for fermenters who have health problems. Um, and so a lot of the techniques that I learned for fermenting sauerkraut are kind of considered overkill, are not really things that people have been doing for thousands of years. Um, and are not what most people do who make sauerkraut. But that's how I learned it. And um, I don't necessarily have health problems, but I have had IBS problems in the past. And so I wanted to implement these things from the get-go and see if they were helpful for me. And what I found is that 
It makes really consistent sauerkraut. I've never had any problems with mold or yeast in my sauerkraut. Oh, I just heard a baby start to cry. Um, we'll see how long I can do this for. And um, I also know that I'm getting really high probiotic counts, really low histamine levels, um, and lots of other benefits that you can ask me about later if you wanna learn more about that. So um, that's why I've chosen to do it this way that I've learned about in this group. Let's pause. Okay, I'm back. I chose these bill wire jars because this is how you can control how much oxygen gets into your ferment. Every ferment needs a little bit of oxygen, but that little head of oxygen can be enough for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, the reason why people with health problems in particular need to control how much oxygen gets into their ferment is because um, mold loves oxygen and uh, yeast loves oxygen. And while there are beneficial yeast in your ferments, there's also some yeast that you do want to keep out um, and you want to keep under control. Um, so from what I've read and understood uh, that you want to achieve an anaerobic um, ferment so that it encourages the probiotics, but it discourages mold and yeast. And the longer you keep it anaerobic and you don't let oxygen come in and out of a, a leaky vessel with a leaky screw top lid, um, it also improves things like how the starch is broken down and also histamine and other things that bother people um, that may not bother you and me. But I do it because I want high probiotic count and I want to not have any spoilage issues or mold issues and um, that's what I see. The other thing I really like about these jars um, is because they are trying to achieve an anaerobic ferment um, and they're trying to limit how much oxygen comes in, they are self burping. Um, so I don't have to worry about forgetting about them on the counter and not burping them like you would with the mason jar, you have to burp every day. Um, but this bill wire, when adjusted properly, manually, um, will offset the gases that the fermentation naturally produces without inviting oxygen in, unlike when you burp a jar manually, um, you may be inviting oxygen into your ferment when you're letting gases out. I like that these self burp. Um, so that's why I've chosen the Fido and the Le Parfait. I don't have a favorite. Um, it really comes down to size um, and also price and availability. So that's why I've chosen those. Also, I'm gonna talk about why I do the 10 to 12 weeks in the refrigerator. And that again comes back to the women who've taught me how to ferment on this um, group about how to ferment when you have health problems. So what they assert is that the longer you keep your ferment going, the healthier it becomes, the more it encourages the good stuff and discourages the bad stuff and the better the probiotics come um, become, um, and, uh, they are, uh, intolerant of things like histamine. Um, and I, I don't honestly got to read more about what they don't like in their ferments. Um, but I just follow their rules and I never have any problems. And I'm just really confident that I'm getting a ferment with a very high and very diverse probiotic count. So they say that there are four stages of fermentation. And the first three stages actually happen pretty quickly in those first seven to 10 days on the counter. Um, but it's that fourth stage of fermentation that takes much, much, much longer. And it's in that stage that a lot of the beauty happens. I wish I had totally read up on it before I started making this video, but I haven't. Just know that I've read it before and I'm like, oh, that sounds great. That sounds healthy and beneficial. I'll do that. Um, so that's what I do. You don't have to do it that way. The nice thing is that people have been making sauerkraut for thousands of years without any fancy European jar, um, without YouTube videos, without Facebook groups, without refrigerators. And so you don't have to do it that way, but that's the way I do it. And I feel really confident about my results. Um, the people who sell sauerkraut in your grocery store, at your Whole Foods or your Trader Joe's, many of them I know here in Ann Arbor, one company that I like, they make their sauerkraut in open air uh, ceramic crocks 
and they do it in about seven to 14 days and then they bottle it and sell it at Whole Foods for $9 and it's about half as much sauerkraut as what I get in here for a couple of bucks. Um, so, you know, you can do whatever you're, you feel comfortable with. If you're just a nerd and you want to do it the way the sticklers do it and see what level of sauerkraut you get, go for it. I enjoy it. I also find that the older my sauerkraut, the more mild the flavor um, versus when I just do it on the counter and eat it right away. It's, it tastes a little bit more like a salty, sour cabbage water, uh, which is fine. That's what a lot of sauerkraut tastes like, but the longer it's in my fridge and it just kind of metals together and it gets old and um, it gets delicious and it's much more mild. Sometimes it's even sweet. Um, so that's just the way I like to do it. And you don't have to do it that way, but you're asking me how I do it. That's how I do it. Um, there's also lots of different recipes you can use. I like to start just with green cabbage. Um, it's the traditional way of doing it and it's also a nice light color brine. It's easy to sneak that brine into your kids' orange juice. I'm at the point now where I tell them about it, but initially I was like, you're not gonna eat sauerkraut. I'm gonna get you some of this brine into your orange juice. It's delicious. So that is uh, how I make my sauerkraut. And let me know if you have any questions about anything I've mentioned. Bye.